Welcome to the Make Your Mark podcast. Hey everyone, I'm Mark Moyer, author of Win Again, speaker, career coach, and business advisor. And I help athletes, executives, and entrepreneurs reach their fullest potential. What you're going to be hearing in every single episode are conversations with athletes and other sports-related influencers. And we'll be offering you the insight that you need to succeed in life, including advice that will let you jump past your competition, whether it be for a great new job or taking your business to a much, much higher level. Make sure to connect with me on social media at Mark Moyer Coach and go to my website, markmoyer.com to get access to the tips and strategies that my coaching clients get directly. If you're looking for ways to make your mark, send me an email to mark at markmoyer.com and I'll get you going right away. Thanks for joining me today. It's going to be an awesome episode. Now, are you ready to make your mark? Let's do this. Welcome to Mark Podcast. My name is Mark Moyer and I'm broadcasting to you live from New York City. Super thrilled because I just finished a conversation with Lauren Brill. Oh my God, a quote machine. She is incredible. But she is not only a former athlete, but a former uh, sports reporter. But best of all, she's got a new company called The Unsealed. You're going to hear all about it in this episode and so much more. This is really one you need to focus on and listen to. You're going to love it. But before you do that, Go to my website anytime, markmoyer.com, for access to all the previous episodes. Um, lo- so many great guests uh, across the landscape. They've been all amazing. Also, lots of great content. On top of that, tackle what's next. We're super excited about that. There's a summit coming up in Miami, end of January, and uh, we're launching the website soon, so make sure to check that out. But before I keep on talking and talking and talking, I just got to stop and let Lauren do the talking. Enjoy this episode. Happy listening. Welcome to Mark Podcast. My name is Mark Moyer, and I'm broadcasting live from Decibel Studios here in New York, probably the best sound studio on the planet, forget New York. Um, and uh, many thanks to Matt for letting us record here. And I'm with Lauren Brill. She's phenomenal. She's got so many great stories to tell us, um, and also a whole lot about her new company, The Unsealed. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And really, before we jump into the unsealed. I, I want to talk a little bit about your background and really just start off with the fun stuff. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about where you grew up and what got you into the whole sports thing in the first place. So you want to go back, back? Yeah, <laughs> yeah like right. twelve years. Yeah, twelve years. No, I'm joking. Well, it starts even I before know, I know, that. I know. So, um, yeah, I wanted to be a sportscaster since I was about ten years old. My dad uh, bought my brother's season tickets to the New York Rangers, and I was a little angry and was like, "Just because I'm a girl, you don't think I want to go?" So we started taking both of us, and then my brother was like, "Dad, she can go." <laughs> and so, really? yeah, yeah, he, he wasn't as into it, and I was really into it. And he only had two seats, so it went from switching off to between me and my brother to just me going and we went together for years and I was a pretty good athlete. I played soccer and lacrosse and I loved being around athletics and so that was my that was my dream since I was 10 years old was to become a sportscaster and first I was a writer for NBA.com. I wrote for the NBA, ESPN, um, Nike Women, a whole bunch of places I wrote for and then I switched into TV. So uh, wait a time out a second. Uh, so when you were going to the Rangers games, who was your who was your play? Did you have a favorite? Or? I mean, probably Mark Messier. Yeah. Um, but I really liked um, cheering for Buka Boom because I like to say his name. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that just you, aged me, by the way. Yeah. Well, he's he's a big dude too. Like, yeah, I mean, he's, he's just a solid big guy. No, I just really liked his name. Buka Boom. <laughs> yeah, that's no, great. It's a great hockey name, right? Yeah. So and and then what? You know, so that's what got you into sport casting. But tell me a little bit about going to college. Were you doing some of that there? Or what was... Uh... So I went to college in New York City. I went mm-hmm. to Columbia University. Um, I actually majored in sociology. And I wrote all my papers about the social impact of sports. Um, and I also interned at CBS and NBC. So I was kind of doing those two things. I wasn't doing too much on campus, more so just internships. But it was interesting because I always say sports casting was my childhood dream. But my adult dream is to basically change the world because I became so passionate about social issues and just the things that I wasn't aware of growing up that are our problems in our society, whether it be sexism, racism, or any sort of hate or discrimination. So those are issues that I really started to recognize in college, and I tried to use and I try to use sports as um, a lens to examine those issues and create change in our society. That's that's amazing, and because uh, there's lots of isms out there, and mm-hmm. most of them are bad. So it's it's good to shed light on those. But yeah. So what? Um, 
So you started doing the sports casting thing and, and the and the reporting and so forth. But what tell me a little bit about those, you know, those chunks of years where you were doing that work. I think that all of peop all of us, like yeah. me, we watch games on TV and we see the sideline reporting and we see the stuff that goes on and we yeah. say, Wow, that looks number one looks so easy. Number two she just shows up, does that, and goes home, and whatever it is. So. Well, I didn't do sideline reporting. Okay. So I was more, like, I worked for the local news affiliate. Okay. So I worked for uh, CBS in Cleveland and ABC in, uh, I'm sorry, CBS in Buffalo and ABC in Cleveland. And what, I did a lot of storytelling. Okay. I did a lot of, I did investigative journalism. Um, I also was an anchor for the sports casts during our nightly newscast. So it was a little bit different than sideline reporting. Um, but sideline reporting isn't an easy job. You have to think on your feet a lot. You have to be really aware of what's going on in the game and just be really aware of just everything about the sport and, and be up to date and current and um, deal with anything that could happen on the fly, right? But um, And that's the same thing for, I would say, a live sports cast too. You have yeah. to be really on your feet and on your game and just very aware. And every little detail that you say, it has to be right. Otherwise, someone's going to call you out on it. And then the reporting aspect, it's, it's journalism. It's a lot of writing. It's a lot of, um, a lot of thought and a lot of um, f you know, digging and finding the right stories, finding the right people, asking the right questions, and telling a story that's meaningful and powerful. So I definitely don't think it's something that should be dismissed or uh, not considered easy. So when you were doing the, the live sports thing, you had somebody talking, I'm the producer talking to you, right? No. Not, no, that was just, you just did it, right? Yeah, yeah, no. Got I it. mean, we have an IFB in our ear more for cues of, you know, 10 seconds left in the Got show. It. But I didn't have a sports producer giving me any sort of information that was, I, I always wrote all my content and wrote all my, my sports casts. And even when I hosted shows, it was always my own writing or I would ad-lib. That's great because I don't think, mo I mean, do most reporters do their own writing like that or not necessarily everywhere i've worked it's yeah. been that way good yeah. and so you picked buffalo and you picked cleveland um they picked what, me yeah i was gonna say <laughs> they picked me no but offense yes. to all our listeners in buffalo and cleveland we love you um for all that you are um because i've spent some quality time in buffalo and in cleveland it's yeah. um i mean I, I i appreciated my time in both places there was amazing fans and I have a lot of support in both cities that I'm super grateful for. I just say they picked me because it's such, such a hard industry. You don't get to say, well, I'm going to go work in LA or, or Charlotte or Cleveland or Buffalo. It's where the opening is. So mm -hmm. it wasn't a knock on Cleveland or Buffalo saying they picked me. It's just that's that's the nature of the business. You don't get to pick where you want to go. It picks you based on openings and based on opportunity. All right. So sports reporting was your dream. I mean, that's what you want to do. Broadcasting, I know yeah. you said. Um, how did you find out about you landing that first gig? You know, do you, and so my first job in TV is actually at MSG Varsity here okay. in um, in in on Long Island. It was based on Long Island, okay. and that job they gave me while I was still on the interview. <laughs> Oh really? Yeah, I was. I you know Mike Quick. He was on oh, yeah. for years on yeah. high school sports, and um, he was my final interview. I interviewed with like six people that day, and he, I walked into his office in Madison Square Garden, and I'm super nervous. I'm like 22 years old, and he um, he was like, "Relax, Lauren. You got the job." I'm like, "What?" I'm like, "Can I call my dad?" <laughs> <laughs> and I had to go through this interview still knowing that I was so excited to call my father. And then my job. I was also really excited for the job in Buffalo because that was my first anchoring and. I interviewed at the end of July, and my boss, um, at the, he did, he criticized me on the interview. He's like, "You need to do this better. You need to do that. Like, this is where you could work on this." And da da, -da. giving me all this criticism. So I'm like, "Okay, forget that. I didn't get this job." And I didn't hear from him for two weeks. He actually called me on my grandfather's birthday, August fifteenth, which I consider a good luck day. And I was like, this guy is not rejecting me on my grandfather's birthday. Like, I'm not answering the phone call. So he leaves a message and was like, Lauren, you know, please call me back. I really, It's important. I need to talk to you. And I thought, okay, maybe I should call him back. It's bad form to ignore somebody that interviewed you, even if they're not giving you the job. That's how much I did not think I had the job. And then I called and he was like, sorry it took so long, but you know, you don't have the experience of our other candidates, but I don't think someone like you is gonna come across my um, desk twice. So I wanted to see if you wanted to be our next sports anchor. So that's how he offered me the job. And it was on my grandfather's birthday. My grandfather always told me rain was good luck and it was pouring raining out. So I called my dad and I was like, daddy, I got the job. And he, I was crying and he was like, why are you crying? <laughs> <laughs> like it's grandpa's birthday and it's raining. <laughs> that's great though. Yeah. Well, and so tell me about that first day on, on air. What was that? 
I don't remember. Yeah. All right, well, let's go. I mean, look, I guess I was, that's good. I'm sure I was nervous. I, I, I had no experience anchoring, um, very little. I had one I had one or two shots at MSU Varsity anchoring. But, that, I mean, that was hard to, to do something that you had never done before and to really learn on the air. And I, I do motivational speaking, and I talk about – we had a, a, news, a newspaper critic there who – destroyed me said I was the worst ever and just ripped me apart on a daily basis and I'm just trying to learn and, and you're trying to learn you're putting yourself out there you're going out of your comfort zone and somebody's writing every day she sucks you know she's terrible get her off the air her voice is awful she sounds like she has marbles in her mouth and my boss was really really encouraging and he kept saying don't listen to him you don't know what he's talking about just keep going you're doing great you're doing great and I really grew in a very short period of time and I'm really thankful for having bosses that believed in me and were willing to ride out that that early storm with me to let me learn on the job well and look you know what when when you have somebody kind of needling you and and saying that you need work and maybe he's saying you suck but you know at least yeah, you're uh, saying uh, okay. <laughs> but at least look maybe it's uh inspiring you or sort of giving you the nudge that you need it if everybody was telling you how awesome you were yeah you'd, you'd, maybe i mean it definitely head. drove me i think it can yeah. do, do a, a few things when you have someone criticizing you but to, to criticize you so publicly i think that's yeah. something that's difficult and that was something that i really had to grow a thick skin with right because it was it was embarrassing, right? You don't want people to see, see that. I remember I was at a bar once, and everyone this guy comes up to me, and we're like, "Are you the girl from Channel 5? And I was like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, "Yeah, I heard she sucks." No <laughs> way! Oh. And then I walked away, and I was like pouting, and and his, he walked kept following me at the bar. He's like, "Why'd you walk away from me?" And we I he, we had a mutual friend. I was go to the mutual friend hey where do I work oh she's the sportscaster at channel 5 and the guy's like oh, what Whoops. did I do he's like I've never watched you I've only read articles I was like well, right. well thanks a lot that's great <laughs> so that oh was my, my early experience it was fun it, it, you, know, you grow you learn and I think that it definitely made me stronger and gave me thicker skin and also it it as much as it hurt me it also drove me right I was going to figure it out no matter what because I was going to prove that he was wrong and I did. I ended up, Excellent. and really cool was the more he wrote about me, the more popular I became because all of a sudden, all these people would be like, "Let's go check her out. Yeah, like, let's right. see what the talk is about." And even though I wasn't perfect, I think I was likable because I was a young girl trying yeah. to pursue her dream and learn and grow. And so, the more he wrote about me, the more popular I became. People were wanting to protect me. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Well, that's, yeah. that's the best thing too. Um, and then, thanks, Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. And so. I'm sure you've interviewed, I don't even know how many athletes and so forth. Are there some that stick out that you say either, wow, that was an amazing interview or that was such a horrible interview or, you know, what are some yeah, that stand out? I mean, I think when people are really honest and truthful and let their guard down, those mm. are the best stories, mm. not necessarily the most famous player or the most, you know, high profile, like the biggest personality. It's just the people that are really authentic and really re real. And it, their story doesn't need to be something so unique or so unusual to be compelling. It just needs to be someone who speaks from the heart. So um, Taylor Gabriel, he was a wide receiver for the Browns when I was there. He's, you know, been around a little bit since. But we did a story about his mother passing away. And he was just so, so raw and real and... You just wanted to hug him after the interview. Mm -hmm. And I, it was one of my favorite interviews. And it wasn't a story that was so unusual. Unusual. It was just you're sitting down with a person who's really telling you where they get their strength from. I mean, he has a tattoo literally on his heart of his mother. And he says he plays with her every moment. And when he scored his first touchdown, he thought to himself, hey, mom, your little boy has made it. Ah, oh, that's great. So just, just those real stories that are yeah. emotional. Um, and sometimes it's not even athletes that are professionals. Sometimes it's athletes that are everyday people. I did a story on a motocross rider, and I did this in the Unsealed too, uh, who got paralyzed in an accident. And he thought after he was paralyzed, his life was over. Mm -hmm. Everything yeah. was done. Every He can't be a motocross rider. He can't walk. He can't get married. Can't have kids. Like Everything is done. He goes to a rehab center in California, and he meets this therapist, and he thinks she's the She's pretty. Mm. So he gets a little liquid courage at a Halloween party, and he tells her, that he thinks she's gorgeous. They start dating. They fall in love. They decide they want to spend the rest of their lives together. And what do you know? She gets pregnant hmm. to their own shock. You know, he because of his condition, they didn't think that was a possibility. And now he lives in Ohio with his wife and his baby. And he says he no longer asks, why did this happen to me? Because he looks at his family 
and he knows the answer. So I think stories like that, even though it's not necessarily a big name like LeBron James, it just it tugs at your heart and has so much meaning that it's powerful. Well, I think that the average, let's say, public person or sports fan doesn't realize that there's sort of 97% of the athletes that we really don't know. And they all have great stories. Yeah. And we, we usually hear about the same sort of... Na- same narratives all the time. Yeah. And and honestly, when people have told the same narrative all the time, not a knock on them, but they're not as raw or emotional. Like if I tell right. you something, a story yeah. 17 times of like what happened to me yesterday, by the 17th time, I'm not as emotional. So when you get somebody who's telling their story for the first time, you'll get more raw emotion. You'll get more just a f- feeling of human connection. So sometimes I think that's really powerful. So, yeah, my favorite interviews weren't necessarily the biggest names or... Well, and you're right. A lot of times the biggest names do say the same stuff. And to me, there's so many cliches that I, if I hear a post-game interview again that says, you know, well, I mean, the same lines. Yeah. We can all write those lines. I mean, they have PR people basically for those interviews telling them, this is how you answer that question. And this is dreadful. I just once want someone to say, no, I just want to kick his ass. Or (laughs) something instead (laughs) of like... Real, right? You want authenticity, right? Yeah. It's it's just, um, you know, and and I get it that there's uh, the whole uh, branding thing and so forth. But I think sometimes if you're authentic, you're going to get much more of a push anyway out there on social well, media. Well, so. authenticity also can ca- cause more controversy. So that's what that's that balance for some of the guys. But when someone's just opening up about their story or their past, I don't think that's as controversial, but you're all, you're being vulnerable. And that's scary too. Oh, yeah. So when you get somebody willing to be vulnerable, it's really, really powerful, I think, for me personally. Which is a perfect segue into the Unsealed, of yeah. course. Yeah. So... I'm going to not ruin the surprise or okay. the story, whatever it is, but tell me a little bit about what brought you into the Unsealed and what, what really got it going. So when I was in Cleveland, um, I was connected to Cheryl Sandberg. Cheryl Sandberg was or is the C- CFO? C- she's not the CEO. She's she's a C-level executive yep. at Facebook. Yep. And she was working on her option B. And she had heard about my story. I'm a sexual assault survivor. And she said, why don't you share your story on my website? I'm telling stories of women who've overcome adversity. And then around the same time, I did a story about, about a woman who was, um, she was abused by her boyfriend. She was a division one runner. And she ended up breaking up with him, starting a nonprofit and educating people about domestic violence. And she also became an All-American and broke six school records after they broke up. And after she did the interview, I asked her what made her decide to come forward and speak so publicly about something so painful and so personal. And she said, I realized it was the silence of victims that allowed predators to continue their predatory behavior. Mm, So there I was like asking her to share her story and I'm silent about my own. So I felt like a hypocrite. And then when Sheryl Sandberg approached me, it was kind of like the perfect opportunity to be like, okay, this is a very classy and appropriate time and place to share my story. And I was I idolized Sheryl Sandberg. She's you yeah, know an amazing feminist, an amazing woman who's done so many things. But her site had a lot of parameters. So I did it with her site, but also if I was gonna come public and be so honest about something that was so so painful and so secretive for so long, I wanted it to be on my terms. So I did a piece for her and then I decided to write an open letter to sexual assault survivors. Mm. And I was very honest. I was drugged when I was sixteen years old by two strangers and assaulted and I told my whole story, and I got, the letter went viral around the country. I got feedback from girls, from men, from women who were either inspired or motivated or had a similar story of their own, and it really broke a lot of silence, and it was before the Me Too movement, so it wasn't a, in a moment where everyone was talking about this issue, so it was much more shocking to people that I would come forward and talk and talk about it so openly, and it was it had such a profound effect on me. I thought to myself, well... What if I could give other people the same opportunity to express their voice and their truth and break the silence on other issues and Mm -hmm. empower people? And I I have the ability to write. Not everyone has the ability to express themselves. So my thought was like, how can I help other people express themselves? Mm -hmm. So what I decided to do is create a platform where we tell stories in the form of open letters because I think it's more powerful to talk to someone, give someone a message than just to tell your story. Right. And we talk about all different sorts of issues from sexual violence to disabilities to um, mental health and the LGBTQ community. Yeah. We, we try to really touch everyone. 
And my idea is to create a platform and a movement where people can share their truth and we can inspire a world where racism isn't just a fight for black Americans or people of color and sexism isn't just a woman's issue and gay rights isn't just for the LGBTQ plus community. What I want to create is a platform where people stand for people and we hear their voices and understand their struggle and find ways that we could be part of other people's solution. Because sometimes we just don't understand. You know, at the end of the day, no matter what, I'm a white woman and that's how I walk through the world. So I won't completely understand or know the struggles of a black man. That's just Mm -hmm. one example. So I wanted to create a platform where we really break down those barriers and create more understanding. Now, who do you find are the, um, is there a subset of people or people that, that have the most trouble wanting to come forward with their story? Is it, is it sexual abuse? Is it LGBT? You know, what, what do you think are, or is, I mean, and is there, is I think it something... it's hard for everyone to be vulnerable. Yeah. I think everyone has a story. I don't think there's a person on this planet that works, walks through life without a challenge. Mm. And being vulnerable is, is not easy, but it's also really empowering. And when you're vulnerable and share your, your story, you don't need someone else to have the same story as you to ch- make a difference in their lives. There's a quote from um, Randy Pausch. He wrote the book, The Last Lecture, and he gave the last lecture. He was dying of cancer, and it was about what he wanted to impart on young minds. And he has this quote that says, don't tell people how to live their lives. Tell them stories, and they're, they'll figure out how it applies to them. Mm. So when you share your story or I share my story, someone else may not have the same story, but they may be able to take something from your experience and apply it to their lives. And Furthermore, also when you share your story, there may be something about your experience that someone else wasn't aware of because it's not their experience. And now they could be more aware or cognizant so that they can become a solution to your problem instead of someone just not aware and not helping that issue. Now, do you find that people that are in more of a spotlight, uh, like, for example, athletes or entertainers or, you know, et cetera, do they find it harder to come forward with this or not necessarily or... I mean, a lot of the people that I've been approaching are people that I've had some sort of connection with or know someone who who knows them. So there's a level of trust. Mm. So that's been helpful. But I think that at the end of the day, people are people, famous or not. I think there's, there's the same level of apprehension. Because even if you're not famous, if you put something publicly out there, everyone in your circle is going to know. So it still feels right. like you're very exposed. Right, right. So I don't think that there is necessarily... Um, that much of a difference in terms of human emotion between someone who's famous and being vulnerable and someone who's not famous and being vulnerable. Maybe there's a little bit more at stake Mm. um, in terms of financially or business-wise, but I think emotionally the feeling is just the same. So did you, when you decided that you wanted to run with The Unsealed, did did you sort of almost ask for Cheryl's permission kind of, or you just kind of said, I'm just going to go well, for it? Well, so or? I didn't start the Unsealed till two years after I did the thing with Cheryl. So okay. what, there are two were completely disconnected. Uh-huh, she uh-huh. kind of just planted the seed of, mm-hmm. of speaking truth. And that, that was my opportunity. That was when I first decided to speak my truth. Okay. And then I created this whole, whole concept of like, let me write my truth in an open letter. And then that was so powerful for me. Two years later, I created the Unsealed. So that was kind of just something that planted the seed and showed me how powerful truth was, how powerful expressing yourself was, and how writing can really, and writing letters can really connect people. So that was kind of just the catalyst to something that was happened two years later. So how are you f- um, finding stories for the Unsealed? I mean, how, The same know. way I found stories for local newscasts, talk to people, yeah. read, uh, look on social media, connect with people you know, ask people that you know. There's just, everyone has a story, just who's willing to share it. Mm. And we want a vi- variety of stories and storylines and also a variety of, of people we want to make sure we're hitting all walks of life. Right. But yeah, I mean, it's just putting yourself out there and, and meeting people. And it's the same way I found stories when I was a newscaster is getting yourself out there, asking people questions. And sometimes I'll ask someone to do a story and I won't really know their story, but I just, there's something there. I have just kind of like a feeling and I'll sit down and start talking to them and I'm blown away. Hmm. And their story is so much more than I even anticipated. And that's most of us. I mean, most of us have a story that's, that's more than meets the eye. I think I have one of those too. Yeah. Maybe seven of them. Yeah. How much time you have? Um, no, but that, so where do you, like, what's the ideal scenario for the unsealed going forward? In other words, I know that you want it to grow and you want, you want, there to be obviously lots of exposure and so forth. But yeah. I mean, I think the idea is also that you really want to become one of the voices or the voice for, for a lot of this. But what's I mean, the... I would, I mean, there's too many issues that I'm tackling that I, I can't be a voice for things that I don't, I don't experience. It's, it's very hard mm. to um, 
you know, I am I'm a straight woman, so I can't speak for someone right. who is transgender or someone who is who I can't speak for someone who is who is a black female mm. trying to to ascend in this world. We all have different experiences. What I'm trying to do is create a platform, encourage the idea of openness, honesty, and people supporting each other. That's my voice. My voice is let's hear each other out and support mm. each other in these struggles. I can't be an advocate for a struggle. I can, I can be an advocate, but I can't speak on experience for a struggle that I don't experience. All I can do is listen to someone who does have that experience so they can tell me how I can help them and how I can be part of the solution. Like even with – I'm learning a lot recently or in the past few years about um, gender identity and – Someone said to me that the most important thing is my name, that you call me my name, because that's their identity that mm. a lot of people want to deny them. So that's, that was a learning for, experience for me. That's how I, I show that person the utmost respect. And the only way I can know that is if they tell me and I listen. And so it's just creating a platform where we support each other. We do what we can to create equality for all different people. Like if I'm a woman, I can't just fight for sex against sexism. I have to fight against inequality for everyone. And that's what I want the platform to be is a place where all these movements come together and support each other and find ways to help each other. And I'm kind of just the conduit, not necessarily like anybody's voice. I don't want to speak for anyone else. Everyone has their own voice and I'm trying to help them use their voice and send their message. Well stated. Um, you know, I, I get a little frustrated because, um, you know, it's clear to me that, especially in the news cycle these days and so forth, there's one side and the other side for everything, right? There's no sort of in between. Yeah. It just seems like you're either one party or the other. You're pro, you're pro this or not this, and so forth. And it, I feel that a lot of times um, people get sort of assigned these beliefs and assigned certain things. Like you know, nobody really knows how I feel inside, and I don't. I don't really go out there and tell the world about my view yeah. on a lot of things. And to me, by creating a platform, I think it's fantastic because it really allows people to show sort of all their facets, right? Yeah, and, and we're not trying to be political. Mm. Um, I think politics is a very complicated and heated topic in our society. And we're trying to break down those barriers and just let people talk from here, from their heart. Mm -hmm. And I think at the heart, we're all really, really similar. And if we can hear people's stories and if people can speak from their heart, then I think that we can break down some of those divisions. And so I don't want to talk about something that could potentially create more division. Um, so yeah. even when we talk about racism or something of that nature that does have political undertones, we talk, we talk about them through, not through politics, but with through, um, through personal experiences and through uh, people's hearts and people's pain and people's triumphs. So it's emotional experiences that everyone can, on some level, relate to. So you can't really have sports in there because I'm not. No, gonna, I'm not going to open. No, no, I can't open up about how I feel about the Red Sox. Oh. So, you know, I just can't do that. That's a whole different. Um, We're working on a piece with a former Red Sox manager, Terry Francona. The piece is actually done, but I'm holding it for for closer to spring training. To see, never mind. Um, uh, you're like, where are you going with this? Yeah, I know, right? Um, so. With all of this, like, how's the? I mean, are you? You've got to be excited about how this is all going. Are I'm, there any? Are there any frustrations? Are you like anxious? What's What's been? Oh my god! Hurdles? Starting what? your own business is like being dropped in the middle of the ocean and some and being like, "Go find land." Yeah. Like, it's it's a roller coaster. But if you're passionate, it's it's a fun ride. But there are days where I'm like, "What am I doing?" And then there are days where I'm like, "I got this." Most of the days, I got this. But then, I mean, right. everyone has their moments when they're starting something that is in an, un an unknown territory. And I'm not only starting something in unknown territory, like my goal and where I'm headed is really unknown. I don't know what my future looks like. I don't know what the future of the unsealed looks like. But I'm really excited to find out. And I'm going to put my whole heart into figuring it out. And it's just something that I've decided that for better or worse, I'm sticking with. We have similar stories because I'm I'm feeling the same way now with what what I'm doing with tackle what's next where I'm so certain of its importance and its success and so forth because it's it's something that's I'm very passionate about yeah. it uh, you know in terms of really helping <clears throat> so many athletes that fall off a cliff really sort of not have to fall off that cliff yeah and um, 
And you're right, it does sometimes feel like I'm in the middle of the ocean swimming. And I, <laughs> I wish I had a little floaty with me or floaties and stuff because that'd be so much easier. I know, you don't. It's just swim, find, your, find and, land. <laughs> and also like a little coconut with a drink coming out of it. And then, um, <laughs> someone fanning me and never mind. But, um, but you know, I, I think that the hurdles are often there to sort of really help us be more convinced of what we're doing, right? That and also the hurdles help us refine our ideas and help us figure out how are we gonna make this work? If it just worked out and everything was fine, we wouldn't really refine our ideas, we wouldn't really think things through because it was just so easy. And my dad always told me, and this was true in sports casting too, uh, anything worthwhile doesn't come easy. If it was easy, everyone would do it, right? So it's just, you have to decide if it's worth it. And if you're passionate about it, it's always worth it. I mean, even if you fail, you have to love the journey. And so if you love the journey, then you didn't fail. Wow. Nicely done. I made that one up on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got a pen? Anyway, oh wait, we can listen to this again. Um, so, so in terms of going forward, I mean, so let me take a step back. If if there are listeners out there that have gone through something, I mean, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? And and what's the smartest? I am way the use? easiest person in the world to find. I have wow. Instagram, Laura underscore Brill. I have Twitter is underscore Lauren Brill. I have the unsealed www.theunsealed.com and my email is right on there. Uh, you can contact me through the website. I have a Facebook page, Lauren Brill, and I have the unsealed Facebook page. So there are a million and one ways to contact me. So there's no excuses. All right, good. <laughs> so, and, but I, I think most importantly though, um, obviously there's going to be some reluctance to come forward and, and speak to you. And so, I mean, it's just the, the nature of it, but. Depends on the person. Some people want someone I mean, a lot of times well, when someone else shares their story, there, there's an instinctive reaction, well, this is what happened to me. And that was what, when I first started telling my friends and family about my past, they were, I would say seven out of 10 times, someone would say, well, this is what happened to me. And it was shocking. I was like, wait a minute, we all have the same secret. Why are we keeping this a secret? So I, I experienced the Me Too movement probably about five or six years before the Me Too movement happened. And I had always thought, what if everyone just came out and said, hey, this happened to me? And then they, we eventually did that. And it was like not a shock to me, but it was a shock to everyone else. Right. But right. I knew because I had went up to people and talked to my friends and said, this is what happened to me. And then it was always, well, I never told anyone this, but, and even when I'd go motivation, go around to high schools talking to kids and giving motivational speeches, these kids are writing me and telling me their stories and telling me, hey, like I haven't told anyone this, but after hearing your story, I want you to know that this is what happened to me or thank you for sharing because this happened to me. And, and usually it's not the same exact scenario, but it's something along the same lines. And it almost, when you one person speaks up, it gives someone else permission. Right. It says, oh, it's okay. Well, look, I'm sure, look, I'm sure the ability to tell a non-family member, a non-friend, yeah. but just open up without it being judged and being this and that and, and having a sympathetic, not a sympathetic ear, but a whatever, empath I mean, whatever the word Compassion, is. Compassion, empathy. Right. Is somebody, when you've been through the same somebody, thing. So, yeah. Somebody who who gets it and who's not mm. going to judge you and right. who's just going to say it's okay. And you're not going to feel like an outcast. Because I think some of these sub-subjects, people like mental illness or sexual violence, some people feel like if I speak about this, people are going to think something's wrong with me or people are going to label me something or people are going to think this or that. And so that, Gary, and when someone does it and their and their appearance is strong and their appearance is powerful and their appearance is success successful, then I think that all of a sudden it changes the way someone looks at their own story and how it can be projected and how it can be perceived. Um, and even issues that are controversial, like talking about racism, a lot of people aren't comfortable talking about it because they don't want people to think, oh, well, if you're white and you're talking about being black or white, you're racist, right? And like, uh, I did the story with a Thomas Q. Jones, who's a former football player turned actor, and we wrote in his piece that says talking about race doesn't make you racism. Asking questions about something you don't know about or an experience you don't have doesn't make you racist. What makes you racist is pretending there's not a problem. And so we really wanted to drive that home point home because I think some people just are afraid to ask questions and are afraid to talk about subjects because of how because they're afraid that it'll make them look ignorant but that's not the case you know there's no way you can know someone else's experience you only know your own right so but the way you show caring and the way you show empathy is by asking someone right and how can i help so the unsealed is obviously a <clears throat> a great opportunity for not just people to um 
sort of come forward with a lot of what they've gone through, but for other people to really read about it. And, yeah. and that's the whole point, right? And bring everyone together yeah, and create right. compassion and create support and create a world where now we can really candidly talk about some issues so we can figure out how to make it better. How can we make the ne it better for the next generation? How can we make it better for ourselves? How can we make it so women don't go to the work, go to work and get abused? How right. how do we do that? Well, right. we have to know the problem first. We have to, uh, and we have to have compassion for the problem. And then once we can do that, then we start really thinking about solutions. So this sounds amazing. I Thanks. mean, you got to be excited. I mean, this is great. It's, so now I I have you to can't tell that I'm passionate. <laughs> no, I haven't picked up on it yet. But, Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so we, but that's great though. But so now I have to shift into the business part of things because I I also love it when I see a business that or a company or uh, what you're doing, I, I also like to hope that it becomes successful because that's the whole point. I mean, you love doing this, but at, at the end of the day, there's bills to pay and you got to support everything and so yeah, forth, right? I like food. Uh, you like food? Yeah. Sushi is my favorite. <gasps> I think we talked about this. Anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> so, so with that said, how do you feel is the best way to... I mean, the mission's fabulous, but how are you supporting it? What's the best way to support it? Well, right now I'm doing public speaking, and I do get paid for my public speaking. Um, and initially I wanted to get an anchor brand or sponsors or things mm. of that nature to sponsor the site. But I am still, I'm a little bit hesitant on that because I don't ever want the message to be controlled or the message to be influenced in any way or even to have the appearance. So what I'd like to do, and I'm just starting to implement this, is create, um, create. I want it to be user co contributions. I want users to say, hey, I like what you're doing. I support mm -hmm. this kind of content. I like reading your stuff. Here's $3 a month. Here's $5 a month as a way for me to say that I like it. I don't want to make the it a subscription where it's where you have to pay to read any of the stuff mm. because if we do that, then we, we defeat our purpose of, right. of openness and having people hear our voices. Maybe I'll do something where there's bonus content and there's a paywall. But really, I want the message to be heard by everyone so that we can create that change that we're looking for. And I want people to support our movement by and support and enjoy our stuff and show it by making a contribution. Yeah, you don't want to necessarily block people out that for whatever reason they can't afford it or yeah. whatever it might be. Um, and you, you want that to. So, so could you have um, sort of specific, um, maybe whether it's charities or, or causes or something to sponsor or I guess it would go the other way around where you'd want to raise yeah, money and for we, them. Yeah, and so. we do help raise money. We pair mm. each story with us with a charity mm. so that um, we can encourage people if they like a, if they like a story about um, like we did one with somebody from the LGBTQ community in this story and the charity they p picked was Crisis Text Line and okay. so we got a sponsor to give money to Crisis Text Line in honor of like every share time the story was shared and yeah, so we pair stor stories with charities that make sense for that story. And if you like that story, you can donate to that charity. But um, I, we're not a nonprofit, so we're a for-profit. And part yeah. of the reason is because it, there's a lot of limitations with nonprofits, even from talking about politics and talking mm. about certain issues. So yeah. I don't, I don't want to be limited in any way. But I do want to take, and I also want to take the money and reinvest it in doing more, uh, more of this content, but in different ways. So I want to do. TV shows maybe for Netflix or have it grow in different sorts of mediums. And so I just don't want to be restricted in how I can reinvest the money, but I want to reinvest it in, in more content that helps create change in the world and creates more understanding and openness. Well, and I think that the more, and you know this, the more you write and the more you um, share of your own story yeah. and your own background. And I think that, um, because you're right, I think people say, oh, well, look, here she is. Here's Lauren. She was been on TV. Yeah. She had a great upbringing. She went to Columbia, wherever that is. Um, and no, I'm just kidding. That little unknown school no, that, was, that I love. You know, a guy I <laughs> Go met, Lions. There's a guy I met the other day, and he said he was a Harvard MIT grad. And I said, I'm not familiar with those. Are those, Never community, heard of them. Are those community schools? And Never he was like, what the? What? You know, I, Columbia is great. But I, what I always say, the best thing I got from Columbia is when I went there. I, I was nervous. I didn't know if I was smart as smart as the other kids. My brother went there, and I always thought my brother was a lot smarter than me. And I remember thinking, like, I don't know what if I'm what I'm capable of. And I said when I said this in a speech um, when the, with uh, future undergraduates coming with pers our prospective students. I st when I graduated, I still didn't know what I was capable of, except the difference was that I expected to surprise myself. And that attitude has carried over in today, where I don't know what this looks like. I don't know what I can do. 
but I expect myself to surprise myself in some great ways. Well, look, and I think that people that tr try to have their own businesses, um, a lot of times do surprise how, themselves how much they do know. Yeah. And uh, Or how you, much you just can figure out. Like, oh, I yeah. don't know this. Okay, like, here's a book. Read it now. <laughs> figure it out, right? Sink or swim. Sink or swim, yeah. <laughs> There's no floaties, so you got to figure it out. I was just thinking about floaties. <laughs> <laughs> or what is that thing? The little floaty yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> In fact... There's a business idea there somewhere. I'm not <laughs> sure where. And I don't have time for it, but we'll get someone else to do it. <clears throat> anyway, so so in terms of like tomorrow, the next day, the next day, I mean, are you trying to now get some speaking opportunities? Or are you trying to just spend more time on on the content itself? I and mean, what's what's the near term? I'm trying to split myself in half and be 12 people at all once right, and cool. do it all. Yeah, that's you think that'll be, no, no. no? Uh, we'll get more floaties. <laughs> I'm gonna have twice as many floaties. I'm trying to do as much as I can. Mm. I, I mean, I, I don't leave home without my computer. My computer is with me now. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I go, I have my computer. So every single second that I have a downtime, I can pull my computer out and get work done. I mean, that was my mentality when I was in high school. I was an athlete and I was president of my class and I did all these different things. So I learned that that attitude then of you you do things as you, uh, when you can and time management. And if you have a day where you are ahead, get even more ahead. And so it's just a matter of trying to do as much as possible and, and taking advantage of every moment while also maintaining some sort of balance in your life. Because if you don't maintain a social life or a relationship with your friends or family, it's not healthy. Right. And so you have to also maintain that balance. And I work out. So I do that. I'm super excited you didn't break out the laptop during our thing here, like in between qu answering questions. Uh, well, you well before we started, you, yeah. told, you told me about something. Don't repeat what it was. Yeah, but yeah. I was like, oh, let me correct that. Let me fix that. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's. I think that's also just yeah. kind of par for the course for having your own business. Of like course. something goes wrong, you're putting oh, fires yeah. out and you're oh. constantly well, I say it's a giant game of whack-a-mole. You're always whacking something and the next yeah. thing pops up. There's always something going on. Yeah, you're always checking your mail. And I, I, I feel bad that I'm always checking my phone so much, but I'm like, oh, just one thing really quick. <laughs> just one email, I got to answer it. I get that uh, 100%. Now, what's the best way that... Um, I mean, if somebody does want to come in and support you right now, is it is it to hire you to speak? Is it to... So hire me to speak, yes, that would be awesome. I'm also, it's not on the site yet, but it will be in about a week or two. So, so basically a subscription, but in the form of contributions because I don't want to require a sub subscription. Mm -hmm. So $5 a month, $3 a month, $10 a month, 80 a month if you can if you can make it happen. <laughs> now, whatever of course you can, they can. Whatever you can do to support what I'm doing. And if you like it, you know, you pick the price. So whatever it's worth to you, I hope that you show your support. We're thinking to send you some floaties. Um, I don't really like getting my hair wet. <laughs> well, that's the whole point. The floaties <laughs> yeah, will help that. Um, <clears throat> so you've also agreed, and I'm holding you to it again, um, to um, be a part of one of the panels that we've got going on down in Miami. Yes. Tackle is next at the end of January. And um, we're excited because when we want you to moderate, I haven't really told you this. I'm throwing it on oh. you right now. <laughs> Um, so even on my camera, I can't say no, right? <laughs> that's, that's the rule. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Something like that. And there's no editing, remember? Oh, there's so, no editing. So, I'm so there's no right. Like, it's binding rup, agreement. Rup. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. But uh, no, but it's all going to be about philanthropy and really um, sort of how, how to, I mean, this is why I think you're, you'll flow really nicely yeah. into all that. But, um, you know, again, what we're focusing on so much with ours is, is, is I mean, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of cross collaboration I almost said contam yeah, I almost said contamination, synergy. but that's probably the wrong no, word. No, I don't use. like the word contamination, especially yeah, where no, we're drowning in the ocean. Oh, no, no, <laughs> without, without floaties. floaties. <laughs> you know what? After, you know what? Out of every one of my episodes, something comes out of it. This one's gonna be floaties. Yeah. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Scratching my head on that one. I know, right? I had this great interview. No, wait, I didn't have a great interview with Mark because we talked about floaties. Anyway, <laughs> but. Um, but I think the whole thing about the athlete space, and, and that's what I'm focused on, but I think it also goes into military veterans as well. And really, quite frankly, lots of people go through at some form of a, sort of a fall off a cliff when, whether they're come out in, coming out of school or coming out of a, a tough job or a tough something. And it's all about really giving them, the, putting them in the right mindset, right? And, and the, having the confidence to be sort of back on their game again. But yeah. But let me ask you this. When you were playing, you said you played sports back Soccer and lacrosse. Okay. But do you think that when you were playing that, uh, I mean, you were practicing and so forth, did that give you a specific sort of training for what was coming next in, in terms of I think your playing mindset? sports is critical 
especially for women, because I think boys naturally compete mm. on the playground, whereas mm-hmm. girls will maybe play dolls or play different different games. I think competition is so important. I think learning how to lose is important. I think learning how to win is important. And I think it gave me a very tough mindset. I think it gave me a very driven mindset. I think it showed me work ethic. It showed me toughness. It showed me teamwork. I don't think that I would have the same confidence, the same courage, or the same determination had I not played sports. And I wouldn't have the same friends. I still have a best friend that I met when I was 14 on my traveling soccer team. So sports gave me a lot and I'm really, really grateful. And it also solidified my relationship really with my father because he was the one who was at every game and my mom was at every game too, but my dad and I really bonded over the sports. And he, after every game, he would be like, this is what you did well, this is what you didn't do well. And I just love those conversations in the car ride because I had his undivided attention. Like, I don't really care like that much. I mean, I cared about the game, but it was really just the interaction with my father that really made it so special and so enjoyable. And so there's so many things about sports that I'm so grateful for. And I think that's why I love sports so much because it's it's my, my connection to my dad, I think, because we both really like sports and does he know that um he knows i like going to games with him and we talk about sports but i don't know if i've ever like verbalized that to him exactly so, so he'll probably I've, listen to that's this that's right all right he's my biggest fan with everything if you look on his facebook page he actually looks a little creepy because he's got all like the screenshots of me on tv i'm like dad this is like 50 like it's too many <laughs> and they're all you know they're not uh perfectly posed pictures they're me like <laughs> <laughs> like and then he tags me i'm like no uh-uh. uh, he means well <clears throat> uh, not that i would know because yeah. i'm not that age obviously um if he wasn't my I'm father joking. i would call the police because i think i have a stalker <laughs> like that's how bad it is that's how many pictures he has of me on tv on on his facebook page but i love you dad <laughs> <laughs> stalker dad i mean i love dad. you that's great well look uh, so jumping into a segment called hit your mark super okay. duper easy Sounds Maybe. pressure. Sounds yeah. A lot of pressure. Let's see if we can handle this. Okay. Um, so, if you could play a sport today that you had no clue how to, I mean, if you've never played it before, but you could jump in right now, what would you do? A sport that I never played. Oh, that's hard. I, I like boxing a lot, but I've done it before, but I don't like the concussions. <laughs> but I love hitting things. Uh, I don't know. That's a tough one because I've tried everything. I really like ping pong, but I've played that before. Oh, yeah. I pers- we should, we should no, play it sometime. I know. I, I love rollerblading, but I've never done it competitively. I would if, if I could go back, I'd be an inline speed skater. Oh, really? Yeah, I love it. I'm And I'm really fast, but I never did it competi- competitively, so I would like to do that. You know what? My next guest on the podcast is a um, professional ice cross. Oh, so or, cool. You know what that is? No, not really. <laughs> no, it's cross country ice skating, right? No, no. almost. Yeah, like it's, where, go, it's like it's a, long distance. Ex, it's an ex. No, it's an ex. Stop guessing. <laughs> <laughs> Letter E, all the above. It's uh, where they all there's like ten of them. We start at the top of the mountain. It's like an X Games thing, and they all they all just kind of go like down a uh, course, like a. Yeah, that's like cross country ice skating. I was right. It's basically it. Cross country is cross country skiing. You're thinking about the, um, well, I guess, but they're going high speed stuff and. Uh, I think I don't know if they allow um, checking or not. Uh, probably not. No, but if it's X game, they probably do. <laughs> I know, right? And then hit each other with floaties. Yeah. But anyway, um, but uh, but that that'd be cool. Yeah. I, I'd like to try that sometime. I think that and when they do the uh, see, I like rollerblading because it's warm. Uh, I don't, like I, I was a figure skater when I was a kid. I was too cold. Let's see when you fall on rollerblading. You fall. I mean, I'd rather fall on ice or I don't snow fall. or something. Oh, nice. None of that. <laughs> oh, I like fall. that. Um, all right, next question. Do you own a boat? No, no, those are expensive. No. <laughs> <laughs> if you could, if you had one, what would you name it? Um, I don't know. The unsealed. <laughs> and I was going to say, no, it has to be the sealed. The sealed? Because <laughs> if it was unsealed, that'd be. Uh, yeah, that'd be bad. That'd be bad. I don't know. Um, I would name it, I don't know, with love and hope. Oh, there you go. Nicely done. With love and hope. And a couple of dollars in between. Yeah. <laughs> love, yeah. hope, and some money. Um, and uh, last question, and it's a pretty easy one, actually, even though it's a hard one. But These are all it, hard. No, they're not. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but in terms of your legacy, I mean, obviously, you're whatever you are, 22 or 3 or something. Exactly. But, <laughs> but, 
But, and this is sometimes a question that people hear when they're older, but in terms of a legacy, I mean, obviously you're already developing a great one with the Unsealed and so forth, but how do you feel you want people to know you and remember you by? Someone who cared about other people and who fought for other people. Who, yeah, someone who fought for other people, not just not, not just herself. That's it. Perfect ending. I love it. <laughs> well, thanks so much for being on, Thank Laura, you for and having making me. your mark. I mean, you are, it's called Make Your Mark, and you truly are making your mark uh, oh, thank everywhere. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate your support. Oh, absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for joining us today on this episode of Make Your Mark Podcast. The goal of the podcast is to help you find ways to make your mark, to succeed in life, and to jump past your competition. Be sure to leave me a review on iTunes and Stitcher and subscribe to be the first to hear new episodes. If you're looking for ways to make your mark, send me an email, mark at markmoyer.com, and I'll get back to you right away. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.